okay um thanks again uh, okay so as i was mentioning uh, uh, today we start speaking of uh, basic sat solving techniques so we give an overview historical overview and uh, what, and also including some current technique of um, of main sat solving techniques and uh, uh tomorrow uh, well tomorrow we'll get into the cdcl sat solving technique which is um, the leading technique in uh, currently okay so <laughs> the first obvious way of uh, of solving a formula is an exhaustive evaluation of all sub formula for all total candidate total proof assignment so substantially you you can uh, start by um, you can take uh, one total total assignment at the time remember there are two to the n ones and uh, then uh, exhaustively evaluate uh, uh, the all sub progressively all sub formula until you get either two or false and then uh, you go ahead until you find one which makes the formula true or you exhaust all the total uh, total assignments well this requires polynomial space because an evaluation requires polynomial space so you need only keeping only one truth assignment at the time and the evaluation requires uh, um, a polynomial space but of course this is of, not of practical use unless you have uh, three or four variables because uh, you have uh, you, you need uh, analyzing explicitly two to the n uh, lines uh, where n is the number of polynomial variables so this is not used in practice apart from uh, making it tiny exercises uh, in, uh, in with a very small formula. Um, instead, let's start with a very, very important uh, um, concept, which is the concept of resolution. Um, resolution is, uh, is not really a technique, but uh, it's uh, a sort of meta technique because many, many uh, different devices are implicitly based on the idea behind the solution. Okay. In general, uh, resolution-based techniques uh, uh, are refutation techniques. When, by refutation, I mean something which aims uh, at uh, trying to infer faults. Okay. Trying, so st you start from a formula and try to find a contradiction. And if you find a contradiction, then this means that you uh, the formula is unsatisfiable. Because if you can derive a contradiction, the formula is unsatisfiable. Okay. If you fail and you have no more action that you can do, and you fail to infer a, a contradiction, then this means that the formula is satisfiable. Well, phi is represented as a set of clauses, as usual, so as in F. And the idea is to apply uh, iteratively the resolution rule, which we are going to describe in the next, in, in the next slide, to pairs of clause, which contain a conflicting literal. I will show you what I mean in the next slide, until you are able to infer a false clause, so an empty clause. Okay. Or no more rules can be applicable. Okay, so this is the basic idea, and uh, there are, of course, many different strategies that you can apply. Okay, very, very importantly, is the, the resolution rule, which works as follows. Um, resolution rules can apply to pairs of clauses which have uh, exactly one incompatible variable, so one incompatible literal, which is called the resolvent. So suppose you have a clause which contains a literal L plus something else, and another clause which contains the negation of L plus something else. Remember that uh, if L is a negative literal by not L, we mean the, the atom, okay? So we don't have double negations. The negation not AI is not not, not AI, but AI, okay? Okay, so in general, in this case, uh, we can uh, think of the clause as being made by three parts. Uh, the resolvent, one with a positive occurrence and the other clause with a negative occurrence. Then a, com a possibly empty common part of the clause. So the part of the clause which is shared by the, um, by the clauses. 
and the, the part, the proper part of the clause, the, the specific part of the clauses, which you call C, C prime and C2 respectively. Okay, so substantially, these two clauses have a, a possibly empty common part. Okay, the resolvent and then the specific part. Notice that, uh, of course, a resolution does not depend on the order of the literal symbols in the clause. Okay, so we just put uh, all the, com the common part on the left, the solve in the middle, and the other part on the right, just for, for easiness. Okay, so for, just for convenience. Okay, but this does not definitely does not depend on the order of, uh, of the literals. Okay, if this is the case, so if you have two such clauses, then you can infer another clause which contains the common part and the two specific parts without the resolvent. Okay, here is the intuition for that. Um, you know from the Aristotle's principle that either L is true or L is false, tertium non datum, okay? Okay, so you can, no matter what, in any possible models, either L is true or L is false, okay? So, if you consider the case, first, where L is false, okay? This is a disjunction from the case where, so this means or, or between the, the uh, true case and the false case, okay? Okay, if you consider the first, the false case, Okay, if L is false, then this is, this is a disjunction. So you have the common part plus the C prime part. Okay, if you knew that L is false, then you would infer the common part and C prime. If you knew that L is true, okay, then this is a disjunction, so the resolvers go, the resolvers go away. And then you have the common part and C second. Okay, so this means that the result is the or of the two cases. L is true and L is false, which means the or of the true uh, of the false case, so the common part and C prime, or the, the, the true case which is again the common part, which we don't repeat, of course, because L or L is L, okay? C or C is C, okay? And the second part, okay? So is it clear why this property hold? Everybody? Yes. Okay, so let me make an example, for instance. Uh, if you have a clause uh, A, B or C or D or E, another clause A or B or not C or F, then AB is the common part, C is the, the not C are the solvent, and D or E and F are the specific part respectively. Then you can infer A or B or D, so the common part, D or E, this part, and F, this part. Okay, so far? Okay, you may find this uh, uh, property quite easy, but this is very, very important and it captures a lot of situations. Um, if you remember that an implication, so A implies B, can be written as not A or B, okay, then what happens is uh, that you, you can see that, for instance, the transitivity of implication, so A implies B, B implies C, means that A implies C, Okay, is a subcase of a, of a resolution. You see that quite clearly. Also, that also multiple uh, combinations of uh, of this uh, of this rule. But also Aristotle's uh, modus ponens, a a and b implies b. From a and a implies b, you can infer b. So the, the famous uh, syllogy, Aristotle, first uh, uh, Aristotle syllogism is a subcase of a solution if you, if you think uh, uh, A implies B as not A or B, okay? And also, well, there is a script, well, a modus tollens, so the last part, so the, sorry, there's the label uh, which has disappeared here. Uh, so from, uh, if you know not B, and if you know that A implies B, then you can infer not A, 
Okay, this is the call, so called modus tollens by Aristotle. Again, this is a subcase of resolution rule, okay, and many others. This said, okay, resolution has two very, 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 very important subcases, which is uh, <laughs> which are unit resolution and unit subsanction. Unit subsanction, unit resolution says the following. So if you have uh, um, a set, okay, suppose you have a conjunction of, uh, of clauses and you have a unique clauses. Unique clauses will play a very important role in any such solver. Well, if you have a unique clause, so a clause with only one literal, and somewhere else you, you have uh, um, a clause which contains the negation of the literal, then notice that you can resolve this. So you can substitute this clause with this clause here. Okay? Because L cannot be false. Okay? Every possible candidate model of this formula must assign L to true. Okay? Because this is an end and this is one single. Is it clear? So this means that this cannot be, this, uh, this jump cannot be true. So you can drop it for sure. Okay. One second, another important fact is what is called unisubsumption. When you have a unit clause and uh, you have uh, a, a clause where the same literal occurs positively, with the same sign, then this is, as I say, in all possible models, I will be true, is forced to be true. So this means that this clause must be true. Okay, so we can drop it. Since this is a conjunction, we can drop this, this clause. Okay, so we can substitute this set of clauses with one and with, with whom we drop this clause. Okay. These two, rule, these two techniques are called respectively uniresolution and the unisubsanction. And uh, we call unit propagation the combination of uniresolution and unisubsanction. What does it mean? Every time we have a unit clause in a formula, we can eliminate all the, neg the negated literal. Uh, the unit literal uh, from all the clauses where it's negated. Okay. And we can drop all the clauses where such literal is positive. Okay. So when you run, you detect one unit literal, you, and you propagate this value. So means, this means uh, uh, dropping all clauses where the literal occur positively and dropping the, the curse of negative literals in the clause where the occurs negative. But notice that in doing that, other clause, you can create other unit clauses. Because if this was a binary clause, so it contained two literals, and you drop one, then here you have another, another literal. You have another unit clause, which may cause another step of unit propagation. So this is what happens typically in, in, uh, in some algorithm. We have a chains of unit propagations. Okay, unit propagation is deterministic step. Okay, because it's false, it doesn't. So it's necessary. So once you have L, you necessarily propagate the truth value of L because it cannot. This cannot be false. Okay, this is very important. Okay. Okay, so the basic, very, very basic strategy of the PL, which was the one who was proposed in the original davis pattern algorithm in uh, 1960, uh, is very simple. And it's just uh, tries to remove uh, uh, one variable at the time. So uh, this is recursive. So you have a set of clauses here, which you call gamma. And uh, which you originally apply to the, the, to the original set of clause. This is a recursive algorithm. And what you do is the following. So if uh, uh, you have an empty clause, 
belonging to gamma, then you have concluded because an empty close is false. Okay, it means false. Okay, so this means that you can return false. This is the uh, backtracking algorithm, so to say, right? So you have, uh, so you have uh, um, inferred false. Okay, if you, if you cannot, and, and you can inc inc uh, consider um, infer uncertain. If you apply the resolution rule, okay, so you cannot apply any more any resolution rule, then it can return true. So if you don't have any closer which have one positive, the same, which have a, so there is no pair of closer which have a resolvent, okay. So you can conclude that uh, that the form, the uh, you can return true. Okay, if a unique clause occurs in gamma, okay, then uh, gamma you can uni apply uni propagation. So the trick is always try to do a deterministic step first. Okay. So you can unipropagate L. So substantially, what you do is take uh, all, uh, um, drop uh, all clauses where L occurs positively, and from all clauses where L occurs negatively, you drop not L. And then your gamma is uh, simplified, and then you invoke recourse to the DP on the remaining set. Okay. These are uh, deterministic steps. But now, unfortunately, so if you are in a situation where no such rules can apply, you have to take a non-deterministic step. So you have to pick a variable according to some heuristic, okay? And what you have to do is to take the, all, the, all the set of clauses where A occurs positively, and all the set of clauses where A occurs negatively, resolve them and, and drop all clauses. So substitute all such clauses with the result of, this, of the pairwise resolution of such clauses. So take every pair of clauses where one is A occurs positively and A occurs negatively, resolve them. At the end of the day, you generate all such clauses, and you can drop the clause, the original clauses, where C, A, C prime and C and uh, C second occur. You have created a new set of clauses, okay, and then you invoke recursively the algorithm of them. Okay. Excuse me, if I may point out, uh, I Sorry? think uh, that if I may point out, I think there is a typo, and it should be. A that is assigned to select variable gamma. Will Sorry, it where is case? it? Sorry, which line? In the last blue line. The last blue what? line? Exactly. Should that be A, which is assigned to select variable no, you gamma? You are absolutely right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So it's A here. Yeah, you're right. Thanks. Can you send me later an email to remind, remind me of this to, to modify the, the slides? Thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, sure. Okay. Yeah, of course it is an A here, yes. Um, okay, so su suppose uh, uh, you have uh, this very simple example here, right? Okay, you don't have uh, uh, unit clauses here. Uh, you don't have, you do have uh, resolution clauses. So you pick one variable. Well, let's pick uh, A, A1, for instance, okay? Now you have two clauses where A occur positively and two clauses where A occurs negatively. So you have to resolve pairwise them. Okay, resolving pairwise those two here, you get A2. Resolving pairwise this, sorry, you, you get not, uh, not A2, sorry. Resolving uh, pairwise, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, resolving pairwise uh, this uh, with this, uh, uh, you have A2 or not A2. Okay? Which you may or may not recognize uh, to be true, right? 
the Kosovi pairwise this uh, with this you have uh, uh, again not uh, not a two or a two okay and with Kosovi pairwise this with this you um, you have not a two you may realize or not that these two clauses are, are true or drop them okay in general you can but uh, in general this is not much uh, much use but now you have uh, unit resolution you have unit so you apply for instance a2 unit propagate a2 by unit propagate a2 well you simplify you make this true you make this true but you make this false okay by unit um, propagation of a2 you find a contradiction you assign a2 to true and you infer false which means that the form is unsatisfiable okay so you notice that at one layer you remove all instances of a1 so you substitute all those clauses where a one occurs with the the clauses you can infer by applying a resolution rule to all such clauses okay so you have you have a format here without any occurrence of a of a one and then from here you apply for instance unit unit uh, propagation and you get false by propagating a2 in this clause here okay or which versa depending what your unit selects first okay so this is unsat of course okay okay in this case another case you have uh, this formula here again you do have uh, one uh, uh, resolver here which is uh, variable b okay so you select uh, so for instance you decide that the, you select the uh, clause where b occurs you notice that b here b occurs positively and here b occurs negatively so you um, resolve this with this and this with this and then substitute the result um, uh, for uh, those clauses okay so resolving this one with this one okay you obtain a or c or e okay by substituting this with this you obtain uh, not c or f or e at the end you have a close set of clauses without b so you have eliminated variable b okay now you still have a resolvent which is a variable c which you can resolve and then substitute the, those clauses with the result which is a or e or not f but now you cannot do anything more because you don't have any more possibility of resolving anything so you can conclude you haven't inferred the false clause so you can conclude that the form is satisfiable okay i'm sorry, I'm sorry. can i ask one question here yeah uh, so I understood the part where you are uh, on the first step, you're trying to eliminate B, you're doing A or B or C. So A or B or C pairwise with not B or E will eliminate B. But sorry, I don't sorry, get how, part, first line. In, the first, in the first line, how are you, so I understand that if you do it pairwise, it will be eliminated from both the clauses. No, but okay, so what you do, yeah. you take all the clauses where B, so the point is, at every step, you eliminate one variable right okay so in this step here you eliminate b okay okay so take all the clauses where b occurs okay, okay. and you substitute them with the, the results of all pairwise resolution of such clauses okay okay so you take those clauses from those clauses you can infer by resolution these two clauses okay this with this gets this this with this gets this okay you see that right, right. yeah yeah that, that I see. and then you yeah. substitute these three clauses with these two clauses okay okay yeah. notice that if you had here other clauses where b did not occur they, those clauses will be stay here remain uh, part of the formula right okay so if i had here close uh, 
say on uh, which the, say uh, E and F, okay, E or F, right. then E or F will, will remain here. Okay. So the, the idea here is that you remove progressively one variable. Okay. Okay, so what's the drawback of this? <coughs> um, the drawback of this is that uh, uh, the number of clauses tend to blow up because uh, every time uh, you have all the pairwise possible combinations. So if you have k, so suppose you have k variables and and uh, so two k two k clauses where a occurs. So it means that you have, for instance, k variable where uh, b occurs positively and n variable where uh, b occurs negatively. Okay, you have uh, uh, k times n new resolved, new resolved clauses. Okay, instead of n plus k vari uh, clauses, you have n times k clauses. Um, okay. Okay, so get back here. So substantially. Suppose uh, uh, the variable, the clauses uh, where A occurs are K, okay? And uh, the clauses where not A occurs are N, okay? Then the possible result, uh, you, you have uh, Java N times K result, uh, resolution. Close the inferred by resolution, okay? Because you can resolve pairwise all, all uh, the possible combination of this group with this group. But overall, so you add n times k closes and drop n plus k closes. So, in fact, this technique is not very efficient because it tends to. Uh, Produce a huge amount of close or resolving or resolving clauses. Then, of course, you can eliminate some redundant some redundant ones and so on and so forth. But in general, this is not very efficient because you can produce a huge amount of clauses. Okay. Did I uh, reply the properly? Have I answered properly? Uh, for me? Yeah. Ah, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, absolutely. thank you. Okay, one more. Uh, okay, one more example. So here, a uh, similar example. If you have uh, here the situation where you have B, so you pick not the, here you may either pick B or pick uh, A or pick C. Okay, so suppose you pick B. If you pick B, then you have only resolving these two clauses. Not that uh, this uh, a, um, a, a or B and A or not B, you get A. Not that two clauses just are passing, remain there, right? As I mentioned before, all the clauses where uh, the resolve is not involved just remain there, okay? But now I decided to, to pick A and I resolve A with uh, not A or C, and A with not A or not C, okay? Which means that the next step, I have a C or not C, but then for a unit uh, um, uh, in a resolution, I have a false, okay? Are those examples clear? So is it clear what it does resolution does? So this is not, so, okay, so this is not an efficient way of doing things because typically produces lots of uh, clauses, but it's very important to understand that because uh, uh, resolution, resolution has a, a very essential role in uh, uh, modern, uh, uh, modern such solvers, which we'll see tomorrow, okay, uh, with a completely different strategy. Okay, so I hope it's important that you understand resolution rule, the resolution rule, and the um, and in particular unit resolution and uh, and unit subsection.
Okay, so far? Okay, good. So, okay, in general, resolution requires CNF. Some people conceived also schemas for non-CNF non resolution, but it's not very popular, very used. The problem is that uh, uh, the number of closer can blow up in space. So, as I said, every step uh, you where you merge uh, n closes with the key closer, n positive, n closes with the positive resolvent with against k closes with the negative resolvent. You drop n plus k closes, but you create n times k closes. So overall, you may produce a huge amount, exponentially many closes, which blow up uh, a lot. So this is not much used in Boolean reasoning, but the single resolution step instead with a completely different strategy has a, a very important role in modern uh, CTCL solver, which we'll see tomorrow. Okay. Okay, uh, now, second technique, which is also very much, uh, was, this, was, this is very popular between logicians, but it's very, very inefficient uh, from the viewpoint of uh, reasoning. Um, is there anybody of you in semantic web Description logics, knowledge representation. No. Yeah, so I, I work in the I work in the knowledge representation group, but I do not work in description logic. So I studied semantics. Luciano Serafini. Oh, Luciano. Oh, he's okay. So he knows the tableaus very well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you may be in tableaus uh, very often, in particular with the people. Uh, speaking of description logics, although those techniques are called tableau, but are not real tableaus. Okay. Okay. So beware. When you see see people calling tableaus, the name is a little misleading. Okay. However, so what's the idea of tableaus? This is a, a very different perspective. So the idea is uh, uh, okay. You search for an assignment satisfying file. Okay. What you do you apply recursively elimination rules for the Boolean connectives. So you look at the syntax of the syntactic structure of the formula and you try to break it, okay? Every time breaking, uh, eliminating one Boolean connective out of it, okay? And the idea is that if, a when, a, and a, well, you see that this, uh, will cause a search, so we cause branchings, okay? So this calls branchings, okay? So uh, if a branch contains uh, a formula and its negation, well, typically an atom or its negation, but even if you're able to recognize it, a formula, a more complex formula and a, a, and a negation, uh, there is an I here, sorry, this is an I, not an one, okay? Then the branch is closed, okay? So that branch is found to be inconsistent, of course, well, if it contains a formula its negation. Otherwise, the branch is open. If uh, you end up with an open branch to whom you cannot apply any more, any more rule anymore, then you are, have, you are done because uh, you, uh, you are not able to uh, to find it, you have not been able to find an inconsistency of the branch, so you can conclude that that open branch is a model of your formula. Notice that if the case, this is just a conjunctural a set of literals, because every non-literal formula can be um, broken by some rule, okay? If all branches are closed, the formula is not satisfiable, instead, because if all the branches are unsat, they are not satisfied. So let's see the tableau rules. The tableau rules are these. Okay, substantially there are conjuncting elimination and double negation elimination or elimination and if and only if elimination. Okay, let's call this. Well, this is just the fact that uh, uh, substantially we always uh, interpret the sets as conjunctions, okay? So if we have phi one and phi two, we can drop this element and just consider 
its components because a list of formula is just implicitly uh, considered conjunctively. Okay. So you just break the end and then uh, you, you break and consider all its uh, uh, components. Okay, this is very easy. Well, these two clauses are just uh, the counterpart of the end, just in, for, for, not, um, for not or or not uh, for implication. Just remember that the not or is uh, the end of the negation. The negation of the nor is the or of the negation. And the negation of an implication is given by the conjunction of the implicant and the negation of the implicate. Okay, so notice that this is just a, uh, these two, two rules can be obtained by rewriting this formula as the end of two negations and rewrite this formula as uh, uh, the end of uh, phi one and not phi two. Okay, and then apply this rule here. Okay, and don't. Well, obviously, you can always drop a double negation. So when you bump uh, into produce, of, for instance, in this case, we are, if uh, phi two was already a negated formula, then this would produce a double negation here. Okay, so double neg you, you remove double negations, of course. And then, okay, the most important one is the branching rules. The branching rules so, or, or elimination is the following. So phi one or phi two, okay, um, can be split into the phi one case and the phi two case. So from phi one, you can you create one branch with phi one and another branch with phi two. Okay. So and the same here for not. Uh, uh, Phi one and phi two, so just you can rewrite this as uh, not uh, not phi one or not phi two. So you apply the same rule here, or same. Remember that phi one implies phi two is uh, the same as not phi one or phi two. Okay. So the key point is the or branching rules. You you take phi one or you take phi two, and then you you go ahead. Uh, if and only if when uh, you have an if and only if uh, uh, well. If and only if uh, you can consider either the case where both are true or the case where both are false. Notice that if you go back uh, and see and remember that phi one, if and only if phi two can be written as uh, phi one implies phi two and phi two implies phi one, this is nothing else than the combination of these two rules applied to the expansion of this formula here. Okay. Similarly, if you have not phi one, if and only phi two, you can say that either one phi one is uh, true or phi two is false, or phi one is false and phi two is true. Okay. These are branching rules. So you branch. So branching means that you go ahead in this direction, and if you end up having a more degree, otherwise go ahead in this direction. If you bump to result great otherwise you stop okay is it clear let's see some example same problem as before let's try to solve this by resolution by uh, semantic tableau okay semantic tableaus okay so try first to break uh okay uh the end okay the end is easy right so just uh, drop the end and consider this as a collection of, uh, of clauses. Okay. Now, once you have applied all the end rule, so just to drop those ends and just collect those four clauses, then you start looking to some connected. Let's start from left to uh, start from left to right. Okay. So first you expand this. Okay. So you expand a one on the left and a two to the to the right. Okay, now you are here, and uh, what you have is this. Okay, so try to span this, drop this uh, connective here. Okay, well, this means a one on the left, not a two on the right. Okay, now suppose you are here. Uh, you span, the, you drop this connective here, so not a one. A two, 
okay, you have reached a closed branch. So note that here you can you have a you have a closed branch because you have a one and not a one here. Okay, so this branch is contradictory. Okay, so you can drop it. So this branch is useless. So you can backtrack. Now you have in you have the situation, and again here you you, are, you expand again this in this branch, uh, not a one or a two. Uh, no, sorry. Okay, you are uh, for, sorry. You are here. You, you have already spun this. Okay, now here you can expand this or here, which is not a one or a two, creating not a one and not a two. But this branch here is in contradiction with this branch here. This branch here is closed because of this contradiction. Okay, let's go ahead, backtrack, go in this branch here. So you, you had expanded this and this, so you have expanded this or, so now you re-expand this. Again, not a one and a two. But then not a one is in conflict in this branch with this a one here. A two is in conflict with this not a two here. So you close it. And you do the same here, here, here. Okay, exactly the same. You expand the on this branch. You expand this again. But this branch here is uh, is closed. So a one here you expand here, not a one, a two. This branch is closed by a one, not a one. Then here you span not a one, not a two, but not a one conflict with this and a two conflict with this. So overall, your all your branches are closed. So you can conclude that this for me is unsatisfying. Okay. Okay. So the algorithm is uh, uh, <coughs> works as follows. So again, you have a set of clauses. Uh, if both uh, a Boolean variable and this negation occurs in gamma, then you can conclude false. So you can, these are the causes. So you can, this branch is closed. You can conclude that this uh, branch is closed. Otherwise, well, obviously, if phi1 and, and phi2 belongs to the formula, then what uh, uh, you can add phi1 and phi2 and drop phi1 and phi2. Okay, if you have the double negation, then you can drop the double negation and add, uh, and add the one without the double negation. Ah, okay, I forget. And then on the you invoke recursive tableau on the result, of course. Okay, so these are deterministic steps. Um, when you do, instead you, uh, you analyze the, uh, an OR formula, then what you do is, First, pick one of the two. So drop the so on the first branch, you drop the the uh, disjunction and uh, you add uh, one of the disjunct, and then invoke recursively tableau on the remain on the uh, resulting form. If uh, this uh, returns true, fantastic, you are uh, done. Otherwise, you you explore the second branch. Uh, Roberto, okay. sorry. Uh, I think there is someone in the waiting room. Louder, please. Okay. I think there is someone in the waiting room. He lost the connection oh. and he's unable to join. Okay. Uh, let me uh, let me go to it. Um, participants. Who is uh, Redondi? Okay. Now is admitted. And if you like, I think there is the option to disable the, that waiting room. So that if someone loses the connection, he's. Uh, ah, okay. Ah, disable the waiting room allows everybody in. Yeah. He, ah, he okay. The, uh, I, I will do, next time I will do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Grazie. Scusi. No, the problem. Sorry, I, I don't see this. So please, you tell me if. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. I can think this here. Okay, so, um, okay, is this clear? So the, the branch, um, for those who have attended my formal methods course, 
this may ring a bell because if you remember the algorithm for building a Bulci automata from a uh, from an, uh, an LTL formula or if you don't remember it go back to the, those slides this uh, Barney and Wolper uh, were inspired exactly by this algorithm to do that you, you can uh, take a look and, uh, and verify this. So substantially, the, this, was, this was inspired by this algorithm. Okay, then of course you have uh, you have of course one rule for all of, the, of those uh, of these rules here, right? So I don't repeat them because they are just uh, equivalent. At the end, if you don't have any chance of applying any more rule then this means that you have a set of literal which is not contradictory from which you can conclude that the formula is true. Okay? Is this clear? Any question? Okay. So, um, just a summary of, um, of uh, semantic tableaus. So, the idea, okay, one good news of semantic tableaus is that uh, you don't need the CNF, so it works with every combination of connectives and uh, no CNF is explicitly required. We made an example with the CNF just to compare with the other technique. Uh, the idea is that substantial, it addresses explicit, is a syntactic way, so it breaks a formula. So the idea is attacking the, the syntactic, attacks the, the syntactic structure of the formula and decomposes it every time eliminating one Boolean connective. Well, the ends, of course, are obvious to remove, but uh, when you, you encounter this junction in whatever form, okay, you have to split it, okay? You have to cross a branching, either this or this. Uh, the intuition so why, why okay this is popular in uh, logicians so when the people uh, logicians want to describe that that, that something is uh, there might be exist an algorithm who who solve it that they typically use uh, tableaus for describing the way of uh, uh, branching the, the boolean rules uh, because that's intuitive it's modular it's very easy to extend to other logics and blah blah is catastrophically inefficient from the viewpoint of, uh, of uh, computers, computer science. And the reason is that it causes a huge amount of redundancies, okay? So look here and you will check many, many, many possible redundancy situations. We'll get back to that later, okay? But this is very, very inefficient. So they are not, they are not uh, efficient, in particular when uh, you have repetitions of the same atom with the different polarity inside the formula. Okay. Uh, oh, I think that is. Uh, okay. uh, uh, oh, another good news is that it requires polynomial space. Why? Well, because the, all you need for every branch is to keep track of, of your current branch, right? So you 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 memorize your current branch on the stack. Okay, so uh, the stack is of course uh, uh, linear in the size of the formula, so you, you don't need uh, exploring this exponential um, amount of, uh, you don't uh, need to keep track of uh, exponential amount of information. Okay, um, I think that we can have a break now, okay, and, uh, and resume, let's resume in 15 minutes from now. Thank you. Okay, if, unless you have any question. Uh, sorry, it will be the same meeting link, right? It will be the same link. Sorry? For the Zoom, for the Zoom meeting, it will be the same, same yeah, link. Yeah, all, all the classes are with the same link. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so I think it... Uh, Okay. Uh, so.
Let's start recording again. Okay, so the next one uh, is uh, the grandfather of uh, uh, the most now modern uh, such solvers. And this agree is a DPLL, so Davis uh, Putnam Logan uh, Logan algorithm. And um, this was substantial from more or less the same author of the uh, uh, same authors from uh, um, from the previous resolution, uh, which were uh, Davis and uh, Putnam. Uh, the idea is that you try to build uh, uh, recursively an assignment uh, satisfying a, a formula. And, but unlike uh, the previous cases where you try to either break uh, uh, single connectives or uh, to, uh, you try to um, uh, resolve clauses, the idea is that at each step uh, you try to assign a truth value to one single atom in the sense that to all instances of one single Boolean variable, okay? As usual, I will use indifferently the expression atom, a Boolean atom, a Boolean variable, a proposition, et cetera, et cetera. So what is, how this is standard practice in the, in the community? And, and that's very important. It tries to apply deterministic choices first. This is a rule of thumb, general rule of thumb of all search algorithms. First, do deterministic choices, and when no, no deterministic choices are left, do non-deterministic ones. Okay, so here is the main idea, the main conceptual rules, which are the unit rules, the pure literal rule, and the split rule. Okay. Unit rule is something that we have already seen, is a substantial unit propagation. So every time we have a formula containing one literal as a unit clause, so in the form uh, single literal and uh, the remaining part of the formula, okay, then uh, this means that this, for, this variable must be a so this literal must be assigned to true. This means that if it's positive literal, the variable must be assigned to true. If, uh, the, um, if it's negative literal, the, the uh, literal must be assigned to false. The variable must be assigned to false, okay? So you can substitute, you can assign all instances of that literal to, to true, in, in all the formula. But notice that by assigning a literal to true is also means that I assign the, its negation to false, of course, right? Okay, remember that we do not distinguish between not, not A and A, okay? So importantly, all instances contemporarily. So if you have phi one and A, then you take all instances of A inside the formula and may uh, substitute them with true and then uh, simplify the formula accordingly. Okay, if this is, this is not A here, then you do, you take all instances of A to false and simplify the formula accordingly. Okay, so this is called the unit and uh, notice that uh, if a phi is a CNF formula, this is exactly what we have called the unit propagation before in the, in the previous slides, right? Because meaning substitute negative instances with um, with false, which means dropping them from from uh, these junctions, or substituting uh, um, positive instances with true, which means dropping the wall disjunction. Okay. One uh, rule, another rule, which is less important because it's not much of use recently, so it's not much use either, but it is some way interesting, is the following. Uh, notice that this is a deterministic rule, right? It doesn't create any branch. So when this is the case, you do this. The other rule is what is called the pure literal rule, and it works as follows. Um, 
L is pure in a formula if it occur only positively inside that formula. So if A is, so L is A means that A is pure if occurs only positively in, in, in phi. We have given the notion of polarity at the yesterday, right? If A is false means that not A, sorry, if L is not A, means that A occurs only uh, negatively. Okay, if a literal is pure, then you can substitute without loss of generality, you can substitute all instances of L with true. Why is this the case? The reason for that is that if L, if a formula occurs positively, then assigning it to true can contribute it only positively to the satisfiability of the formula. Okay? Meaning, if there exists a model which assigns L to false, then the corresponding model in, in which L is assigned to true is also a model. Or written another way, if uh, if, uh, if there exists if there exists a model if l is pure is uh, is positive and there exists a model uh, in which l is assigned to false that means that, that variable is irrelevant so assigning that to false is not relevant so if i dropped that assignment this would be still a solution uh, a model for the formula satisfied okay well, think about that. So if uh, you have a formula which is A or B, okay, and you're, you assign the A to false and B to true, this is a model, okay? But assigning B to false, A to false is completely irrelevant, right? So also A and B is a model. Why? Because A occurs positive when you assign it to false. Is this clear? Not much. So if it occurs positively, it means that it occurs positive in a, in a conjunction or a disjunction or something like that. Meaning that assigning it to true makes the global formula more likely to be true. Written another way, an assignment. So if A occurs uh, positively, an assignment uh, assigning A to true has, that has for sure more chances to be in a, a model than the corresponding assignment uh, assigning A to false. Okay? So if an assignment assigning A to false is a model, then also the corresponding assignment in which A is uh, assigned to true is a model. Okay, which means that you can, without the loss of generality, assign it to true. Okay, you can check this on induction on the inductive definition of pure, of polarity. Okay, if a truth assignment, if A occurs positively and the truth assignment uh, assigns it to false, and this truth assignment is a model, then also the truth assignment which makes it assigns it to true, the same is a model. So this means that assigning the, that to false was irrelevant, had no role in, in the satisfaction of the form. Okay, so you can assume without a loss of generality, assign it to, to true. And the split case instead is these are deterministic steps. The non-deterministic steps instead is the one in which you consider first assign a given literal to true, simplify the formula accordingly, or assign it to, fall, to false. Again, tertium non datum. Either L is true or L is false. Okay, so you try two distinct branches, the one in which a given variable assigned to true or the one in which it's assigned to false, okay? Importantly, always apply the split rule after the other two. 
Okay, so this is the, the schema of our formula. Again, uh, consider again the use of formula. Here we don't have a deterministic step because we don't have a unit, unit here. So let's decide the one variable, a, a1. Okay, if I send a1 to true, well, if I send a1 to true, this is satisfied. Uh, this is, no, sorry, uh, if a1 is true, this is satisfied. So the first two closes are satisfied. Then this, this is false, which means that a1, a2 becomes a unit, okay? So we can unit propagate a2. But when we unit propagate a2, so remember, when we assign a2 false, a2 true, also, we have also this unit here. So after, after applying a1 to true, this is true, this is true. Not a1 is dropped from here, so we have a unit a2. This is dropped from here, so we have the unit not a2. So this means that we take the first unit, unit propagate, so assign a1, a2 to true, but then this violates this formula here. Okay, so we can conclude that this branch is, a, is closed, okay, because it made this formula false. Okay, so this was deterministic, so we backtrack. So we backtrack to this choice here. We try not a one, but with not a one here, we unipropagate a two, but also here, this becomes not a two, whereas those are true, okay? So with not a two here, and uh, uh, so a two here and not a two, we unipropagate a two first, drag, but this makes this violated, okay? So that's it. Notice the difference in size of the search space with respect, for instance, with the tableau, to the same formula. Okay? So this boils down to the following algorithm, the DPLL algorithm, davis pattern longer algorithm, which works recursively as follows. Um, well, initially, you start from a, the original formula, and uh, you have uh, and you pass the current truth assignment by reference, okay? So initially, phi is the original formula and the mu is empty. And then you progressively build the mu, every time adding a new, a new literal in. So if at the end of the search, phi is true, okay? So this means that the current truth assignment satisfies the original formula, and then you can return true. Well, of course, if phi is true, obviously the form is true. If uh, phi is uh, the nth uh, call is reduced to false, then this means that the current branch is false. You have found a contradiction. So this means that you have falsified some clause and then you backtrack. So you return false and this will cause you to backtrack. If a unit clause occurs in the formula, then what you do? You assign L to phi. Okay, assign L to phi is exactly this. So phi, assign L to phi is, means substitute all instances. So if L is a positive literal, assign all, so all instances of uh, A to true and simplify the formula accordingly. If L is a negative literal, you assign uh, the um, all uh, instances to false and, and simplify the formula. And you add L to the current truth assignment, okay? So this means, okay, you deterministically assign L, add the L to your current truth assignment and simplify the formula accordingly. Okay, once you have done it, you invoke recursively the function over the simplified formula and the current augmented assignment, okay? The same you do with the literal when, when you have a pure literal. Uh, notice the difference between these two rules. The pure, the unipropagation rule, the unit rule just uh, is a deterministic rule, but because uh, you must do this, okay? So you cannot have any, uh, 
any other model. So L must be assigned to true. The pure literal, is, this is aside deterministic because uh, this is convenient to assign it to true in the sense that if uh, you add a model in which you assign to false, then you also have a model which, in which uh, you assign to true. So it's uh, deterministically better to assign it to true. Okay. Okay. At the end of the day, if you have no, if you have tried to see a no uh, deterministic rule applies, then what you can do is that you you choose a literal. What does it mean? Choose a literal. It means choosing a variable and choosing a truth value to it. This is a non-deterministic step, and you can use uh, whatever heuristic that you you may like to that. Once you have uh, decided uh, the first literal, then you first try to assign L to true, meaning, again, you assign L to true inside F, add uh, L to the truth assignment, and invoke DPLL recursively. If uh, this is true, this recursive call, calls you true, that means that the branch you have has caused you to uh, has led you to, to a satisfying assignment and uh, which has returned true and then you can conclude you can return true not not that this or here has to be interpreted in the lazy sense you know what lazy or right so if the first one first element is true you don't invoke the second one okay Okay, if this is false, then you are uh, you go to the opposite direction and you assign L to false. Okay, and uh, uh, that's it. Substantially deterministic step and then branch when uh, when no more necessary. Okay, DPLL. So this is the the old-fashioned version of the DPLL algorithm. So good news is that uh, it handles well, it handles the CTN formula. There are uh, no version uh, for non-CNF uh, able to reason directly on uh, on non-CNF formulas, but this is not very popular. Well, the very very important thing to understand of DPLL with respect to other techniques like tableaus or resolution that is branches on truth values. So tableaus branch on disjunctions. Okay, A, phi one, go, go left, phi two, if you have phi one or phi two, phi one, go left, phi two, go right. DPLL branch on the truth values of the atom occurring in the formula. So pick one atom and say, okay, let's try this atom to be true. And if not, let's try it to be false. Okay? And you assign contemporarily all instances of that atom. So if you have n instances of that atom occurring, you assign contemporarily all that those instances. And this is done by unit propagation. And another important fact that you postpone, well, which is typical of the search algorithm. Oh. There was one guy who asked to admit who was out. Sorry. Okay. So <coughs> all instances of this atom is assigned simultaneously. The idea is that you postpone branching as much as possible. So this is not, this was substantially ignored by logician because it's not so very intuitive, it's not modular, blah, 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 but is the grandfather of the most efficient. So he has been uh, the most efficient, uh, it has been the most efficient SAT algorithm since uh, to substantially 1985, where a, a much better version of it was conceived, which is called the CD set SAT solvers. It requires polynomial space, yes, because remember that you need the keeping track at most of one branch at a time, of the status of one branch at a time. Uh, well, the 
it's critical. The choice of uh, the literature to choose uh, is critical. So the deterministic taking the right choice is very often uh, impo very very important. And there are many many implementation. Remember, this is considered the grandfather of uh, modern SAT solvers, which we'll uh, introduce uh, tomorrow instead. Okay, are there any questions uh, about uh, DPLL? Okay. Guys, what happened is, I think I continually see people getting out and uh, asking for be readmitted. What's happening? I don't know. Guys, can you speak loudly? I don't know for the others, but uh, I am having a continuous crash with uh, with Zoom, so my computer just freezes and I had to oh, reboot it. Sorry about that. Uh, I will have uh, to so Enrico will have to explain me how to drop the to allow you automatically. Okay. Um, okay. This is uh, so. Are there any question about DPLL? Okay, good. Um, let me conclude, uh, well, with the part, uh, uh, with the tool, which is uh, order by the decision diagrams, uh, which most of you, many of you have already seen in my, in my, uh, in, uh, my course of formal methods, because these are very, very popular in uh, formal methods. So uh, those who have uh, attended my course, formal method course will find, uh, again, uh, the same very substantially the very same slides for that but there is some a little overlapping with this with those two courses but this cannot be avoided okay order decided uh, obdds are another let me call it the sat device although they do something more than uh, than sat uh, which are very popular in formal verification uh, the intuition uh, about uh, um, OBDD is that they are canonical representation of Boolean formula in the sense they are DAG, a, a direct society graph, with one root and two leaves, one zero or two false, two false, or one, however you want to represent true and false, in which a variable ordering is imposed a priori, in fact, they are called ordered by the season graphs. And the idea is that every path leading to the one more uh, to the true mode represent the models, and all paths leading from to zero represent the counter model. Uh, just a, a semantic note: some authors call them R OBDs, so reduced order by the decision graphs. Just uh, just because maybe you you find that in the literature R OBDs, and you see what is this? It's the same that I'm going to explain to you. Okay, so this is an example of, our, of an OBDD. Consider the following formula, A1 if and only if B1 and A2 if and only if B2 and A3 if and only if B3. Okay, um, solid lines represent the true branch and uh, dashed lines represent the false branch here. Every node here is labeled with one Boolean variable and notice that they are ordered. So there is the layer of A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3. Instead here is A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, B3. Okay, so there's an ordering from the top to bottom. As I say, this are an if then else. Every node represents an if then else. So if A1 so this OBDD of this formula is if A1 is true, then you go into the, the OBDD given this OBDD, which is, represents B1 and A2, if and only if B2, and A3, if and only if B3. If this is false, this goes into all this OBDD, okay, which represents not B1 and blah, 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 blah. Here, if A1 is true and B1 is false, well, if A1 is true and B1 is false, this is false. But this is false, so the whole, since it's an end, the whole formula is false. 
So in fact, if A1 is true and B1 is false, you go straight to the false node, okay? So F is the false node representing all inconsistent formula, all false formulas, whereas true here is a node represent all valid formula, that is the true node. Um, here, again, here, if you are in this case where well, not B1 here, if this is true, you have false true, false true is false, and you go to straight to a false node. If you have a false false, then this is true, and you go back again into this OBD, which represent A2 and, and, and if not if B2 and A3, if not if B3, and, and so on and so forth. Okay? So is it clear the intuition of, uh, of the OBDD. If you order, given if you order, you have a, a different OBDD. In particular, if A1 is true, then you have B1, blah, blah. And then if A2 is true, then blah, 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 blah. Then if A3 is true, then blah, blah, blah. Then if B1 is true, okay. If B1 is false, it goes straight to false. Okay, and so on. Okay, so what is an OBDD substantially? Uh, substantially, OBDD is an order decision tree, is the DAG compressed version of a, an order decision tree. Well, an order decision tree is the stupidest thing that you can think about for, for such solving. So take a tree, take a variable in order, and decide that if A is true, then go left. Then is A is false, so re dashed again are false, uh, uh, solid are true, okay? If A is false, then I do this. If A is true, I go there, okay? I have, I expand all the possible combination. Notice that this is uh, not significantly smarter than the, uh, the computing all the combination in the truth tables. It's just a three version of this, right? So if A is false, B is false, C is false, and D is false, then this formula is false. If A is true, B is, uh, if A is um, true, and B is, um, B is uh, um, false, so this makes this false, then if C is true and D is true, then this is true, okay? So you, you find at the end of the day, these models go to one because it's a model if you assign all the two to one are true all the branches which lead to a zero are uh, counter models so falsify the form okay so this is the starting point but then you reduced this and by reduce you do two things so the idea of uh, sharing sub nodes sharing sub nodes is something that you do um so if you have identical trees, you share them by a technique which is called uh, uh, an algorithm which is called hash counting. You can remove redundancies in the sense that if you have a node in the form, if A then B, else B, so if uh, both the left and the right branch of uh, uh, the left successor of a node go to the same OBDD, of course, if A then B, S B is the same as B, right? Because in both cases you have, a, you have B. So you can collapse uh, this combination with B. So alternating, uh, repeating up until a fixed point, those operations then lead you to, uh, lead you to um, a, a reduction of the OBDD. So for, Let's see this example, right? So consider these uh, three here. Well, you immediately notice that there are some redundancy here, right? So D goes to the, both branches go to zero here, okay? So you can collapse them into, so this can be collapsed into zero. This can be collapsed into one, okay? Okay, so you can collapse them to, to zero and ones. But now you still have uh, one uh, uh, redundancy here, so you can collapse this to one. But then you realize that you, you can share nodes. For instance, you can share all the ones. 
okay? But you can see share all the zeros. But then recursively, if uh, they go, they share, the, you have only one zero, and one, only one, one you can recognize that the all two branches lead to the same value, okay? So you can recognize that this guy is the same as this guy, and this guy is the same as this guy. Okay, this is the, so you can recognize, so you can progressively reduce, realize that it collapse, uh, make only one version of this, but then you can realize that this guy is the same with this guy and the same with this guy. So progressively, you can collapse or make only one version of this, but then you recognize that this, this node points to the same two atoms, so you can also realize that the C is, is the same. But then once you have done it, you can realize that you have another redundancy here, okay? Which means that you can collapse. And at the end, you have a final BD. So this is called process, it's called the reduction, and then you, you may reduce significantly, drastically the, the, um, the graph. Notice that the result is unique. The, you may have different strategies, so you can get fa there faster or slower, but the, at the end of this process, when you applied all these rules until a fixed point, until you can, then you obtain the, the very same ability, regardless of the strategy that you have, you have uh, used. Uh, ha -ha. Um, okay, what is what is an OBDD uh, from a recursive uh, viewpoint? Um, an OBDD of, uh, uh, of a formula can be uh, defined recursively as follows. So the OBDD of true is, is node one, which means the OBDD of every valid formula is, is node one. The OBDD of false is node zero. And the OBD of a formula given an ordering A1 and A2, if it's neither one or, or, or zero, uh, is an if then else in which you have if A1, so the first variable, then the left branch goes to the OBDD of the formula phi in which you have substituted all instances of A1 with true. Over, of course, then in doing this substitution, A1 is eliminated, so for the BD bit with the, all the other variables. Otherwise, you have an OBD of phi uh, in which a, a, A1 is false. Okay, so the, the left branch of the lower branches. If you go back to this definition, uh, this case is actually what you have, right? So if A1 is true, then you go to the BDD, which represent B1, blah, 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 blah. If you go to the force, you go to the OBDD, this one, which represents not B1 and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So is this recursive definition on the BDD clear? I would say yes, right? Uh, Okay, guys, I think I, I, play, I hope to, to be able to, to get there. Um, so, are you in a hurry or do you want to let me other 15 minutes or you are in a hurry? No problem for me. I, I would have loved to, to finish the OBD part uh, today. It, it's fine for me as well. Uh, is anybody against that? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I actually other... should, uh, should uh, leave now, but since I've attended the course of formal methods, I think I've already seen. Yeah, uh, you, you already know that, right? Okay, so okay, you've already uh, the same part that I've taught last time, okay? okay? So if you don't mind, I would uh, yeah, say yeah, please go ahead, yeah. see you tomorrow. So is, anybody, is anybody against the fact that I finished this? Okay, let me go through this. Okay. Okay, so how do actually algorithms to build OBDs work? 
So the idea is that uh, um, uh, they bought the, the algorithm which builds uh, an OBD bottom up uh, uh, works as follows. Well, the OBDD of true, regardless of the order is one, node one, the OBDD of false, regardless, is zero. And then, well, the OBDD of the single formula of the, of the single atom is, uh, if the atom is true, then go to atom one, to the one node, otherwise go to the zero node, of course, right? So that's, again, easy. Uh, a little bit more complicated is how do uh, so when you well the negation is uh, um, okay when you apply boolean operators that you have ad hoc operators to manipulate a formula um, uh, which is called apply which I will define in the next slide so the ability of uh, not phi given the ordering a one and not n is first I build the OBDD of phi and then I apply not to the OBDD and I will show uh, the next slide how to do that. Well, the not is easy, right? The not is substantially is inverting uh, uh, um, positive nodes with, uh, with negative nodes, right? So it is inverting uh, uh, um, the one node with, uh, with the zero node. Okay, the more complicated is uh, the building of a generic binary operator here. So uh, if you apply the OBDD of phi one operator phi two, where operator is any possible operator and or not, if not if, blah, blah. Then what you do is that you apply the, the you first build the operator, the OBDD for phi one, then you build the OBDD of phi two, recursively, so notice that this bottom-up recursive definition, and then you apply the operators to the remaining OBDD. The result may not be a reduced OBDD, and then so after that you apply a reduced OBDD to the result, okay? Uh, remember what ITE is, uh, ITE is if, is the same, ITE is if then else, okay? If the if the else operator. How does okay? How does the apply work? Okay, uh, this is if uh, one uh, if I mean the apply uh, if uh, the two BDs are one uh, zero, then obvious the obvious operator applied the two the obvious boolean operator applies. If it's ne negation. Uh, then uh, you uh, you apply the recursive the negation to phi i. Okay, so substantially you you build the the application of uh, not. So sorry, if the algorithm if the the BD is something uh, in the form uh, if a then phi phi i true, otherwise phi i false. Okay then you push down the negation to the two branches. So if A, then apply the negation to phi one, otherwise apply the negation to phi two. Okay, so the, so to say the negation um, uh, distributes with the if than else. The more general case uh, is when you have a binary operator, whatever this operator is, uh, and or implication by implication, whatever. And this works as follows. So if you uh, so you apply the operator to a nobility, which is not a trivial basic one, so it must be uh, an if then else with some variable, right? So you apply the operator to and if then else to AI on some uh, sub BDDs and uh, another AJ on some other OBD. So this is the left branch, the left OBD, uh, this is the right OBD. So you want to apply the, an operator to, to these two OBDs, right? Well, if this is the case, uh, you have to distinguish two subcases. 
the one one in, we, in which ai and a and aj are the same variable so if the the top variable here is the same the root of the two elements the root variable of the two big d's are the same if this is the, if this is the case you can apply you can simply build an if then else in which you apply the operator respectively to the two to the true branches of the left and right element and uh, on the left branch to the fourth branch of the of uh, the first and the second OBDD. substantially you pick the the two true branches and the, the two uh, fourth branches you apply the operator recursively to the two elements and then you build the if then else a slightly different thing that when uh, one is be the variable are not different if the variable are not different so for instance if a one uh, precedes aj then of course the variable will be on aj ai and then you build recursively uh, you apply recursively the on the left branch you you, you build the left branch as uh, applying the operator to the true branch of ai and uh, to the wall of bdd of aj in the other case, you apply the ref branch to the fourth branch of AI and push down the, the OBD of J. The case in which AI is greater than AJ is absolutely the vice versa. Okay, so it's just invert, just inverted case. Okay, uh, so let me see an example how to build an OBD. So suppose that you want to or you build the obd from uh, for a1 or a2 here well you know the the obd of a1 is if then else a1 true otherwise false and for a2 is if then else a2 true false okay okay they have two those two obd and you want to play all here well the two obds have a different root a1 and a2 here okay so what happens is that uh, you uh, you build an OBDD on the the top variables, which is oh I assume ordering a one a two. You build the OBDD of a one, and you apply recursively the OR to the left branch, which is true here, to the the second OBDD. In the right branch, you apply OR to the uh, fourth branch of the first with the wall OBDD recursively, okay? But of course, applying OR to, to something else is true and apply the OR to force to something else is, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the result, okay? So the result is if then else A1, true if then else a2 true false which is substantially this one okay it may sound a little complicated but if you go through comparing with this you see that exactly what i mean now suppose i've built both Okay, at the same time, I build this one is uh, specular with uh, A2, the two inverted, in which I need to invert a positive and uh, a negative branch, right? So you have exactly the same with A2. Uh, well, this is uh, not A2, so there's something wrong here, sorry. Some strange LaTeX thing here. Um, if you apply the OBD to these two guys here, notice that they have the same A1 here. Okay, so you build an IT in which the, the top is A1, of course, because it's shared. And then on the left, you apply the end to the, the left branches of two, the two branches of the two, which is both true and true. So you apply end to true and true. On the second, uh, the second branch is you apply and to 
the left, the, the false branches of the two. Okay, so apply n to if then else a two, two true, and if then else a two true. Okay, so well, of course, apply n to true is true, but apply it a two to apply n to false, apply n to false. Well, notice that apply n to false is false, of course, because apply the n uh, is a true and false, which is false. So this is an ID of uh, false, false, which is reduced to false, okay? So at the end of the day, you have A1 true false, which is actually the definition of A1, which you should not be surprising, right? Because if you have a, A1 or A2 and A1 or not A2, this is the same as saying A1. Another analogous approach on the left gives rise to here A1 and here not A1. And then you have A1 and not A1, which merges into false, okay? Okay, just to mention that the the choice of uh, uh, the choice uh, of uh, the variables which we want to use uh, is uh, critical in uh, with the OBDs. So you can have a linear. So I mean, uh, you can uh, blow up in size uh, if you if you get the wrong uh, choice. For instance, in this case, this is linear. So if you add even 32 or 44 or 64, such a bit, this will repeat simply n times uh, this module here. This guy instead breaks exponentially in the number of the eyes. The rule of thumb here is with OBDDs is that you should uh, keep uh, in the order, keep, keep bits which strongly interact with, with each other as near as possible. So here works well because a1 interacts strongly with B1, A2 interacts strongly with B2, and A3 interacts strongly with B3. And in fact, here A1 is near B1, A2 is near B2, A3 is near B3. Okay? Here, instead, A1 and B1 are far away. A2 and B2 are far away, and that's the reason why. Substantially, nobody tends to blow up exponentially to cause exponential blow up uh, depending on the distance uh, in the ordering by which uh, uh, depending bits uh, are listed. Okay, so this uh, notice that you don't have any cut here until uh, from A1 until uh, you branch on B1. Then only on B1 you, you, you go, you cut down to false. Okay. May I ask a question? Yeah. So the best uh, solution is to group the the variables, the literals that are on the same uh, clause. Well, the point is that it's not necessarily have clauses. Well, remember that literals uh, may uh, occur differently in many clauses in, in different orders, apart from trivial examples like this. So in general, A1 may interact in one clause with B1, but in another clause with B3, and in another clause with A4, okay? So it's not obvious. So the dependency graph uh, is, uh, is quite complicated. So in general, there is no... So apart from uh, easy cases like this, there is no universal uh, deterministic way of getting the best encoding because uh, uh, one uh, or piece of ordering could be good for uh, uh, for handling one part of the formula, but could be very bad for uh, handling another part. Okay. okay. So here is a very is very simple and very peculiar uh, starting in which the dependency of interdependency of variable is obvious, right? A one depend interacts with B one, A two interacts with B two, and the three interacts with B three. But in general, in the formula, this may be quite complicated. So it's not a universe. As an extreme example, keep a, if you know what a multiplier is, right? So it's a Boolean circuit which substantially encodes the, the multiplication of uh, an integer encoder as a bits uh, with, another, with another. And substantially works uh, similarly to the, 
the multiplier uh, with the decimal uh, digits that we are learned in primary school. Then every bit interacts with every other bit. And in fact, it's well known for the, bit, for the multiplier. There's no uh, polynomial BDD encoding in a, um, a multiplier. I don't know whether I, I answer, but there is no universal answer to this question. So there is no absolutely, so there are only heuristic techniques to do that. Okay. 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 One fundamental property of OBD and the reason why OBD are very good is that they are canonical in the sense given an ordering a priori, you have that two formula. If two formula are equivalent, they generate this, an identical OBDD. And the reason for that, think about that. If you impose an ordering, two different formula have the same models and the same counter models. So this means that they have uh, the same uh, bin um, binary decision tree. Okay. Look at the very first, one of the very first slides here. Okay, do we agree on that? Right? But the reduction is the same. So if they have the same, um, the reduction has a unique uh, output. Okay? So this means that the reduction app applied to the same decision tree gives the same OBD. This has a very, very important consequence that once you have built the OBDD, for phi one and phi two, then checking the consistency, checking whether there are the phi one and phi two is equivalent requires constant time. The reason is that if you use the OBDD using the same data structure, so the same graph, so that you have collapsed the OBDD together, you will collapse also to a, a identical OBDD into the same one. Okay, so this means that we'll. Uh, the OBDD built on phi 1 and the OBDD built on phi 2 will point to the same OBDD. So it will take you the time of checking two pointers or two indexes, whatever your, is your encoding of that. So it requires constant time. Once you have built the OBDD, checking the equivalence requires constant time. Also, validity, but this means since the validity check is checking the equivalence of phi against true. This means that validity checks requires constant time. And also unsatisfiability checks require constant time because unsatisfiability is equivalent to say that a formula is equivalent to false. So if a formula, if an OBD is different from the false node, this is not unsatisfiable. If it's different from the true node, this is not valid. Okay? And in general, all the set of the paths from root to one represent the models of the formula, and the set of paths from the root to zero represent the counter models of the formula. Unfortunately, there's no free lunch. The, the fact that what you have to pay is that the side of the BDD may grow exponentially with respect to the number of variables in worst case. Well, this is, of course, a, a consequence of canonicity of the BDDs unless p is equal to p, right? Because otherwise, if we were on the case, the, uh, we would have a very easy way of uh, checking the, the validity of the equivalence to formulas, build the abilities and take constant time to check. If we were on the exponential, we would uh, have a polynomial algorithm to, to check uh, the equivalence to formula, which we know this is not the case. For instance, like typical case, it can be proved that there exists uh, no polynomial size of BDD representing the electronic circuit of a bitwise multiplier. This is a very well known uh, example by Riley Bright. Notice that it is not an, only an issue of the final of BDD that you may compute. Also, the intermediate, so the problem, for instance, if you are checking unsatisfiability, the resulting, if you are reasoning on an unsatisfiable formula, the resulting formula is a one single node. But the problem is that while building that OBDD, intermediate OBDs that you build may be, may be a grow exponentially. So it's not the matter of the final BDD, but, but also of the BDD that you use as intermediate step to build it. Well, think about the example we draw 
here. So the final BDD, the form is consistent, the final BDD is false, but you, you, during that you have to build several of BDDs, possibly big ones. Okay, so there are some, uh, oh, that, uh, so let me conclude. There are some useful operation of a BDD. So equivalence check can be performed uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, is simple, okay, so it's, it takes constant time. When you composed it, the, the size of the BDD in worst case grow as the product of the size of the two BDDs. That's the reason why this grows exponentially, but typically can be much smaller on, uh, on average. Another important factor, uh, which is not as, as important in this course, but it may be important in foreign methods, is that uh, OBD is very good to do quantification. So quantifier is uh, something which uh, substantially is the equivalent to the channel expansion. So, so exist f, f is the same as f uh, in which v is uh, simplified to zero or f in which v is simplified to one and vice versa. OBDD are very good to handle uh, quantification and the reason why is that they are very good in sharing the, the common subparts of the problem. Okay, guys, uh, so I would say just to recall that factorized OBDs are good because they are factorized common parts of the search tree. Um, so they are DAGs. They require setting a variable order a priori, which is critical. And the, what's very important that they are canonical representation of Boolean formulas. Okay, so equivalent formula are represented by the same OBD module of the same order. Once built, the main logic operations are immediate, but the problem is the time take to the time and space to, to build them. They are able to represent all models and counter models of the formulas. They may require exponential space in worst case. They are very efficient for some practical problems like uh, representing circuits uh, or symbolic model checking, as uh, whoever has taken my course in model checking has knows. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Sorry for getting much longer than uh, I planned to, and see you tomorrow. Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. No have a nice, have a nice day. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you. you, bye. 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 Enrico? Prima di scappare, senti, cos'è che devo fare per far sì che i ragazzi siano ammessi automaticamente? E adesso non mi ricordo precisamente dove, forse su participants o così, hai da aprire un menu a tendina dove sì. hai delle checkbox. Mm? E una di queste dice tipo... Eh, Disabilita waiting room. Esatto, se togli la spunta da quello, ti toglie la waiting room e tutti quelli che hanno la... Accendono direttamente. Esatto. Ah, ok, ok, grazie, non lo sapevo. Perfetto, grazie mille Enrico. Niente. Ciao. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Buona giornata, grazie. Grazie, grazie. Oh.